So, welcome to this last day of this wonderful yeah, meeting. Um, some people are missing, some people came back home, and perhaps some other are problem with their car. We had the contamination issue here in Mexico, so 20% of the car cannot run today, so some people, Mexican people, cannot perhaps use their car. Anyway, Manuel is there, and this is the most important thing, and he will present um, his talk on temperature structure and abundances in planetary nebulae. Okay. Good morning to everybody. I will talk on the temperature structure of, and many of the things that I will say on planetary nebulae apply also to, to H2 regions. Some of the ideas that I will present are the result of my collaboration with Antonio Peinbert, Gloria Delgado Inglada, Leticia Carini, Gary Ferland, Bob Odell, Will Henney, Cesar Esteban, Jorge García Rojas y Silvia, Silvia Torres Peinbert. Temperature determinations, there are many ways of getting a, a determination of the temperature. From forbidden line ratios, it is the most popular way of doing it because the lines are very strong. The ratio of, uh, of the strong line to the weak line, the called nebular to aurora lines, it is possible to get the electron temperature. It is also possible to get the electron temperature from recombination processes. So from the ratio of the Balmer continuum to a Balmer line, it is possible to obtain the electron temperature. For the best observed objects, it is more difficult to do it that way because the Balmer continuum is very faint. For the best observed objects, it is found that in most cases, the difference between both types of temperatures are larger than observational errors. And to try to, to include both determinations, you have to assume that temperatures vary over the observed volume. You define an average temperature weighted by the density square because the line emission go like the density square, number of electrons times the number of ions, and then you integrate over the volume. And, and you can define also a small t square quantity that is the average of the temperature given by that equation. So chemically homogeneous photoionization models of cloudy predict values in the 0 0.00 to 0 0.02 range, with a typical value around 0 0.004. Planetary nebulae observational values of this square are in the 0.02 to 0.12 range. These are the best observed objects, with an average value around 0.045. So if, if you derive the abundances using the forbidden lines, you underestimate the abundances by about a factor of two with respect to those abundances that you obtain using recombination lines of oxygen, for example, with respect relative to recombination lines of hydrogen. In this case, the temperature dependence almost cancels out. So if you are comparing recombination abundances, you should not worry very much about the temperature structure. So by adopting this square of values different from zero, you can use the forbidden lines, and you need to have an idea of what the t square value is. And the abundances that you get with the forbidden lines then agree with the recombination line abundances relative to hydrogen, that is a recombination line. Otherwise, you have these differences that go from one 0.5 to 3 in well-observed objects. In badly observed objects, the differences are even larger, but that's due to observational errors mainly. So there are temperature variations that cannot be explained by chemically homogeneous photoionization models. The source of these variations can be many, 
and a specific model has to be made for each nebula. The abundances relative to hydrogen derived from recombination lines are almost unaffected by temperature variations. So this difference is called the abundance discrepancy factor, and it goes to one. It's strange that it doesn't get to values smaller than one because this is an observational quantity. You should thought that way. And so this is a diagram of 20 years ago. So in the vertical axis, the temperature that is used to determine the carbon to hydrogen ratio is a recombination line and a forbidden line. This temperature is less sensitive to variations than the usual one, 4363 to 507, because both of those lines are uh, forbidden lines that are collisionally excited. So if you use <coughs> the mixed temperature, you get carbon values that are <coughs> typically like a factor of two or three higher than the ones that you get using the temperature given by the forbidden lines. And the objects where the difference is largest <coughs> are on the left. And in general, these are planetary nebulae of type one. Planetary nebulae of type one originate in stars of higher masses than the most planetary nebula that are type two. They are more massive. The original stars, the mass of the envelope is larger, and they are closer to the galactic plane, and they have a very high velocity of expansion, the shells, from 50 to 200 kilometers, while the others, the type two, that are more typical ones, they live longer. The central star moves slowly in the HR diagram. They ca can keep ionizing these objects more. And usually they tend to have smaller densities just because they stay ionized for a longer amount of time than the ones of type one. So the, the, the black line is when you get the same answer from both methods, which would imply no temperature variations. But these points have errors that can move, can move you a factor of point to the x one way or the other. This is a typical planetary nebula with a high ADF abundance discrepancy problem. This is the Eskimo nebula, and you can see all kinds of structure, and uh, it, it's not a simple a spherical constant density nebula. It's something considerably more complex that is going to dissipate fast with respect to other objects. Here is also a, an old paper by Liu et al, where they combine, compare the oxygen abundance derived from collisionally excited lines, and they compare it with the that is the abundance discrepancy factor in the vertical axis against the difference of temperature between the oxygen, forbidden oxygen three lines and the Balmer continuum. And most objects show here differences of about a factor of four or less, and there are two or three with factors even higher. And this is, uh, the errors are about the size of the arrow and this is a proof that something is going on. At present, so recently, last 15 years or so, it is possible to get the Balmer temperatures with very high precision. So this is the Balmer uh, decrement going to H39, and what you need to do is to get the continuum between two Balmer lines and subtract it from the continuum of the Balmer continuum to the left, and that ratio gives you the temperature. So with observations of this quality, the error in the Balmer temperature is very small, and 
there are these large differences with the temperatures that you get from forbidden lines. This is the particular planetary nebula where that spectrum was taken. I will get. Now, each uh, emission line has a different uh, temperature dependence. So the ratio of two emission lines or a continuum and an emission line can give you a relation between the average temperature and the variation of the temperature along the line of sight. Here there are five examples. The popular one, the forbidden oxygen free, then the Barmer continuum to H beta, that gives you a temperature that is smaller than the average. The one gives you a temperature considerably higher than the average. You can use five or six helium lines, and each helium line depends slightly different from temperature and you can get also a temperature that usually is smaller than the average. You, there are a possibility of combining a recombination with a collisionally excited line, and it's a more complicated formula with two unknowns, the average temperature and the average variation, the average T squared, and this has been done. So any line ratio from two ions of different elements can be used to determine their abundant ratio. The permitted lines, hydrogen, helium, carbon, and oxygen, the ratio of all those lines, if the observations are very good, are very precise because the temperature dependence almost disappears. On the other hand, the lines that are very strong and that are almost always used are collisionally excited and they are affected by this problem of, of temperature variations. Now, why do we want to have very accurate abundances? That's another talk, but it has to do what you want to know what stars do during the evolution. You want to know how the chemical abundances of the galaxies change with time. And you want to know how the universe started with only primordial helium, deuterium, and lithium, and made all the elements. So you need to know with high precision these abundances to constrain the different theories on stellar formation, stellar evolution, galaxy formation, galaxy evolution, and the universe itself. So one has to find an explanation why the T square is larger than that obtained from a static constant density chemical homogeneous model. There, the, there are six ideas. I will discuss them. And the last three years, the kappa distribution was very popular. You can have planetary nebula with chemical inhomogeneities. And then you get different answers because you are, uh, in some ways, you weight preferentially the, the knots of high heavy elements abundances relative to the regions that have lower abundances. So you have to make a model to consider which fraction of the line comes from the metal rich inclusions and which fraction from uh, metal poor inclusions. You have the position of mechanical energy, turbulence, shocks, and something that has not been discussed and that <coughs> Gary has mentioned several times that the possibility of magnetic reconnection might play a role. Density variations, if you assume constant density and you, the density also varies and can also affect your determination. And you can have shadow regions that instead of being ionized directly from the central star, are ionized by less energetic uh, uh, ionizations. And these shadow regions are cooler. So all these things, I will say a few words about them. So the, the kappa distribution 
produce an excess of high energy electrons and you can observe H2 regions and try to reconcile the, the combination temperature with the off-free temperature. And you need kappa values of the order of 20 to, to 40 to, to explain the observations. Now there is a paper by Fairland and collaborators in, in press where it is shown that kappa distributions do not exist in ionized regions. And one of the main reasons for this is that the electron collisions are many orders of magnitude faster than the collisions needed to excite, for example, the 507 line, six or to nine orders of magnitude. This means that the, if these suprathermal electrons appear, they almost immediately become Maxwell and ice, thermally, thermally the same temperature than everything else. And uh, this applies to almost all H2 regions. Will Hennig has been looking into not only H2 regions, but other uh, densities and temperatures in the universe and in almost all places, with the exception of those places in which most of the hydrogen is neutral, kappa distributions don't play a role. So we can eliminate this as one of the main sources for temperature variations. There is a mathematical relation between T square and kappa, and it's simply that T kappa is uh, For a, a given kappa, you get the, a value of t square. Somehow the equation is, is wrong, but this <laughs> it, it goes like one over kappa roughly. So a kappa of 10 is a t square of 0.096. A kappa of 20 is 0.048. A kappa of 40 is 0.024. So for on that previous region, if instead of putting kappa, we put t square, we can explain the observations also. Now, T square is not telling you what is the physics. It's just giving you a value. You need to find out what is producing the T square. So typical values for H2 regions of T square range in the, are in the range of 0.02 to 0.12. Then there are many methods to determine T square, and you can you can compare Comme qui comme ça, et que le chitelle implore à la lune jusqu'au